Cardiovascular disease, or CVD, is the leading cause of global mortality. Focus is gradually shifting away from treatment to its prevention in order to try to reduce the massive burden that this group of diseases creates. Several effective prophylactic th therapies have been developed and the etiology of cardiovascular diseases has been extensively studied, providing evidence that lifestyle changes could greatly reduce, reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease in those at risk of developing the disease. So whom should we recommend lifestyle changes to and who would benefit the most from prophylactic treatment? We could simply decide to treat everyone with prophylactic drugs, putting statins in the drinking water and pushing everyone towards a healthier lifestyle. But this has its drawbacks. If preventative medicines have side effects or are costly, it would be unwise and perhaps unethical to give these drugs to healthy individuals who are very unlikely to develop cardiovascular disease within the next few years. Furthermore, trying to change the lifestyles and behaviors of the entire world is a little unrealistic to say the least. Instead, ideally, we would like to identify those people in the general population who are at a certain level of elevated risk of developing cardiovascular disease, probably within some kind of time frame, say within five or ten years from now. So we can really target our preventative interventions towards them. So how can we identify people at high risk of developing CVD within a few years? We could conduct a study to investigate which combination of patient characteristics best predicts whether someone will develop CVD within five years, and this is precisely what a number of research groups have done. But let us say that we want to develop our own prediction rule for CVD, perhaps because we are interested in a specific group of patients, for example, women only. Research suggests that risk factors for CVD in women may be different to those in men, and female-specific risk factors could be important in predicting the risk of CVD in women. In this case, our research question would be which combination of prognostic factors, general and female-specific, most accurately identifies women at high risk of developing CVD within 10 years. In this case, our study domain is pretty clear. We're interested in helping clinicians to correctly identify high-risk healthy women, so our domain is all women at risk of developing CVD. Note that this means that we're not interested in studying women who already have had some kind of CVD event in the past, as the best prediction rule for these patients could be quite different to that from healthy women. We could choose to narrow this further but in this case we want to make our research as broadly applicable as possible. Now let us consider the outcome that we are interested in studying. In this case we have decided to focus on the development of CVD within 10 years. But what exactly is cardiovascular diseases and how can we measure it? Cardiovascular disease is not a single disease but a group of diseases consisting of coronary heart disease or CHD stroke, peripheral arterial disease, and aortic disease. We could choose to study all of these outcomes and create some kind of combined prognostic rule that best predicts whether a woman uh, will develop any of these diseases. Alternatively, we could focus on just one of these diseases, which may be preferable if the risk factors for the individual diseases differ, or one of the diseases is of greater interest than the others. For now, we will focus on coronary heart disease only, which also means our research question has changed slightly. Remember that it is absolutely essential that you clearly define the outcome that your prediction rule is designed to predict, especially if you want your research to be used correctly in practice. This leaves us with the task of choosing which patient information we want to collect. As is generally the case in prognostic research, we will need to gather information about our participants' sex, age, health history, 
especially any diseases that are associated with cardiovascular diseases in any relevant treatment, such as medications or other health interventions. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that blood biomarkers associated with lipid levels in hypertension can be useful in identifying those at risk of coronary heart disease. So we may want to collect this information too. In this study, we are also interested in female-specific risk factors, such as pregnancy-associated disorder or conditions linked to hormonal changes. So we definitely need this information. Again, it is vital that we consult the literature and experts within the field so that we are neither wasting our resources collecting information we are unlikely to use, nor miss any important factors. How should we go about collecting all this information? As we are interested in assessing the characteristics of women who develop a disease over time, we will need some kind of longitudinal study that follows the participants over time. Once again, a trial is unnecessary here and the natural choice is a prospective cohort study. As we need to recruit many women and follow them at least 10 years, it may be more practical to combine our study with other large studies or to conduct our study within a pre-existing cohort of women. We then need to take baseline measurements of all the prognostic factors that we are interested in and follow the participants to see who develops CHD and who does not over a 10-year period. So let us assume that a decade has passed and we finally have the information that we need to develop our prognostic rule. How should we go about doing this? First thing first, we need to assess whether we have any missing information, such as missing outcome information or missing information about certain patient characteristics, such as blood test results. In a large study such as this, it is almost certain that there will be information missing for some of the participants. And it is important that we consider why this information is missing and then deal with that appropriately. Then we can go about developing our prediction model. Once again, it is best to select the predictors in our model based on evidence from the literature, but if there are many candidate predictors, we may consider using some kind of statistical selection technique, of which there are many to choose from, with some of them, them being more appropriate than others. Having developed our model, a practical model that requires a manageable amount of patient information, we can consider how we went to present this for use in practice. We could choose to create some kind of app with clinicians can then use to enter the relevant patient information and calculate their absolute 10-year CHD risk. Up until now, we have overlooked one of the most crucial aspects of prognostic research, and that is the validation of our prediction rule. Ideally, an independent study will have been conducted in parallel to this, in a different group of individuals, so that we can assess how well our new model performs outside our study. Without this evidence, our prediction rule still has little practical use, and clinicians would be right to question the usefulness of our new app for their patients. This leads us to the take-home message from this lecture and this week as a whole. If you want to conduct prognostic research, you need to ensure that your research is truly answering your clinical problem. You need to collect the right information in the right people, and the tools that you produce from your research need to work well in new patients. To do this, you need careful planning in the earliest stages of your research, and in all likelihood, collaboration with other researchers.